Hello, everyone, and welcome. We're excited to welcome such a large group for tonight's presentation. My name is Scott Horsfall, and I partner with the clients and clinicians at the Veterinary Medical Center to serve animals and their families. On behalf of our team, I would like to welcome you to our second event of our BMC Animal Health Education Series. The series features our leading experts covering a variety of topics in veterinary medicine, ranging from relevant health information for your beloved pets to ways that we're advancing clinical research that will serve dogs, cats, and people for generations to come. During the presentation, you can use the Q&A function in Zoom to ask questions. We also had nearly 450 pre-submitted questions and we'll do our best to cover the themes that came up most frequently during the final portion of the program. I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Julie Churchill. Dr. Churchill is a professor in the Veterinary Clinical Sciences Department of the College of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Minnesota and a clinician in the VMC's Nutrition Service. She earned her Doctor of Veterinary Medicine degree from Michigan State University and completed residencies in internal medicine and clinical nutrition. She also earned her PhD from the University of Minnesota. Dr. Churchill is a diplomat with the American College of Veterinary Nutrition. We're grateful to have Dr. Churchill with us tonight to answer common questions about your pet's nutrition and to help clarify misconceptions about food, ingredients, and common concerns when selecting a pet food. With that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Churchill. Thank you, Scott. Can everybody see? I imagine you will tell me if you can't. Um, I am so excited to be here tonight to talk about my very favorite topic. It's just really thrilling to me whenever I get an opportunity to talk to pet parents about health. It's just, there's, there's nothing better. Um, as Scott said, I'm here to talk about how to pick the pet food, um, but I wanna first show you this sort of slide that is full of what you might call chaos. And so this chaotic slide is really my home team. This is the group that keeps me grounded and humble. And it's also my mischievous way of showing you that I feed things. And so again, both furred and furless, I have three emerging adults and, uh, and they survived. And also down uh, my fur team down at the bottom. And that was quite a feat to get all five dogs in that picture. But I'm, I'm sort of proud mostly that we were able to achieve it. I have the best job on the planet. I get to serve patients. So I see patients in the clinic as a veterinary nutritionist. I get to work with pet parents and clients and I get to teach. So I'm about half of my, my daytime job is in the clinic and the other half is in the classroom. And I get to work with brilliant clinicians here and colleagues, researchers here at the university. So I can't imagine a better job. And so again, these are just a few of my most favorite things. So whenever someone talks to you about nutrition, you should ask yourself, what's their bias? Because everyone does have a bias. Again, I don't work for a pet food company. I am gleefully working here at the university because it's the perfect job, as I mentioned. But I firmly believe that you are what you eat. If we were all gathering in, in person, which I would love to see your lovely faces, I would ask you how many of you eat every day, at least once. And if you can imagine how you feel if you don't eat for an entire day, you know very well that food matters. So most of us eat more than once a day. Most of our pets eat more than once a day. So how can something we do multiple times a day not impact the way we feel, the way we grow, the way we live. So my bias is that I firmly believe diet is one of the most important influences on, on our health, our wellness. It's an important feature when we do have diseases. I use nutrition in the management of diseases. And we know from research that it also can impact longevity or how long our pets live. So quite simply, I think nutrition is the foundation of health. And so another core tenet or my core belief and bias, as you can see here, the Latin root word of nutrition and nurture 
are the same root word. And so again, as I reflect on how did I get where I am today, I know that I was called to nutrition, to veterinary medicine and nutrition. Uh, they chose me. I didn't choose them because I have a really strong need to nurture and the way that I care for people that I love and want to uh, take care of is through food. And so feed, to feed is to nourish. And that's my bias. I love this Ayurvedic proverb. And so um, just listen to this quote, when diet is wrong, medicine is of no use. But when diet is correct, medicine is of no need. Now, we know that's not completely correct because certainly there are diseases um, that are unavoidable. But in general, when we feed the body well, we can stave off so many chronic diseases that it plays an integral role in health. And that's my bias. So again, what's the overview today? As Scott mentioned, many of you were generous with your questions. And so our team here tonight, Lauren and Kelsey and Scott shared some of those questions with me. And I was able to hopefully to integrate them into tonight's talk. And I will hope to answer many of those questions that came in. But ultimately my goal is to help pet parents and patients with questions on really picking the best food for your dog or your cat. I am a dog and cat girl. I don't practice large animal medicine. I know just enough um, to be dangerous. But I believe that uh, picking the right food is a really challenging thing for pet parents to consider. And so there are literally 5,000 options out there in the US alone. So tonight, my disclaimer is that I am a bit of a nerd, a nutrition and veterinary nerd, and but tonight I'm talking about healthy pets and hopefully teasing through some misunderstandings and misinformation. But again, and I'm an academic nerd, so I am always going to look for the evidence. If, if I want to ask you to make a diet change or make a different uh, expenditure for you or for my pets, I want to see that there's safety and efficacy behind those decisions. I also may be offering you some information tonight that's counterintuitive or counter to what some of the things that you've heard out there because it's a jungle out there in the world of nutrition and it's hard to know where's a credible, reliable source. But the ultimate expert in your pet's care is your veterinary health care team. And in the end, we all want the very same thing. And that is that your pets thrive, that they not just survive, but they thrive and live long and prosper. All right, my other disclaimer is that I will show lots of pictures and sometimes I will pick pet food labels. And so this is neither to endorse or to malign any particular product. I'm merely using them as an example. And so one concept that in the veterinary world, we talk about it all the time and we assume everybody knows about it. And it's very counter to the way humans feed themselves. It's this concept of complete and balanced nutrition. And when we say that term, if you see on this label, you'll see adult food, this pedigree product is complete nutrition. Complete means that it has all the essential nutrients present and available in that product and balanced when we feed to meet the pet's energy needs, then we're meeting everything that they need. So it's automatically balanced. All the nutrients are in the right ratio when we feed the right amount. Now, again, um, a term that we hear and, and where we wrestle with how feeding our pets is different than somehow what we learn. So this is the part that might feel wrong or counterintuitive is that word processed. We learn when we're feeding or making healthy choice for ourselves, we want to avoid processed foods. Because for people, we're taught to shop around the perimeter of the grocery store, where the fresh foods, the whole foods are, and to avoid processed foods. That's true when we're feeding ourselves. Processed foods for human nutrition tends to be for three goals, sugar, fat, salt. But uh, that's a little sarcastic, but by that I mean for treats, nachos, Dorito chips, those sorts of things, snack foods, which maybe aren't so healthful. We uh, process foods for increasing the shelf life, or we process foods to make it a more economical product because we know fresh items are perishable and they don't last as long and they're often more expensive. 
processing for commercial pet food, so dog and cat food, it's a completely different goal. It's the same word, but it means a completely different thing. The goal of processing pet food is to achieve a product that's complete and balanced. Now, again, this is really unfamiliar to the way that we eat. We tend to get up, and again, I told you I'm a bit of a nerd. The average human makes 200 food choices a day. That doesn't mean that we eat 200 items. It means that we say, I'll have a little bit of this. I'll have a little bit of that. Oh, those blueberries were good. I'm going to have a second helping. I want to have a cup of tea. It's afternoon and I'm old, so I need to avoid caffeine. You get, the, you get the idea, yes, no, yes, no, I'll have a little bit. And we hope at the end of the day that we're achieving complete nutrition. Now again, I'm old and when I went to grade school, I learned that we should eat from the four basic food groups. And that didn't teach people how to eat very well, so it became a food pyramid. Some of you may remember the food pyramid, but that was hard for people to understand. They didn't know portion size, it was too confusing. And then, uh, the newest the newest iteration is myplate.gov. And again, as an old sarcastic person, this looks strikingly like those four basic food groups that I grew up with. So again, we're going to mix and match and mix and match. And by the end of the day or the end of the week or the end of the month, we hope that we're getting all the nutrients that we need. Complete and balanced nutrition for a dog or a cat, when we pick a really great product, it in fact provides everything they need in each and every bite and each and every meal. Don't you wish that you could find something that you loved as much as your dog does that provided everything they need? I tell people, even as a nutrition nerd and trying to make healthy choices for myself, I can tell you on my dog's worst days, they eat better nutrition than I do on my best days. That's kind of sobering. And so even though we pick a product that is complete, complete and balanced, and so by the end of tonight, you'll know how to pick that perfect product for your pet. I hope, I hope that's true. At least you'll have a better idea. But even though it's a complete and balanced product, that doesn't mean that your pet is achieving complete and balanced nutrition. Now, here's one of the most common mistakes that I see from really, really smart people. And so that's about treats, because what's life without treats? We, we know we want to treat our pets. We know that we use trait. Uh, Dr. Flynn gave a most excellent uh, talk just uh, last month. And so I hope you all were able to attend that. And so we know that treats are an important part of training our pets and helping them become good citizens. But when those treats, so if you imagine an old teeter-totter, when those treats exceed 10%, it tips the balance of the nutrition even if those treats and snacks are excellent nutrition. Chicken breast is a lovely treat that many owners like to give their dogs, especially for training. But when it exceeds 10% of the total, it's giving a lot of protein, it's giving a lot of phosphorus, but no calcium. So you can see how that tips the scale of that balanced nutrition. When we keep the treats in the range of 5%, or, or so, then you, you don't impair the balance of that nutrition and your pets are getting a great, great option. So how do I start to navigate this when they, I just told you there's 5,000 products. It's really, really confusing out there. And I can't memorize all those products because even if I did today, three or four of those would be off the market tomorrow. It's a ever evolving process. So let's start navigating the pet food label, which is a good place to start. And as you can see, if you march down the pet food aisle, it is even more mind boggling than the cereal aisle in the grocery store. I've listed these nine components because the pet food label is a legal document, believe it or not, AFCO, the American Association of Feed Control Officials, is our governmental federal agency that oversees and or makes the rules regarding pet food labels. It's highly regulated. Each and every one of these items by law must be on the label. So the first skim is if any of those are missing, I know that the company is breaking the law. 
But let's sort of parse this down, like what are the important things? Because even though it's a legal document, you know that those pet food labels are jam cram full of information, not just on the front, but on the sides, on the back in microprint. And so I have to use my reading glasses just to look at those cat food cans. So I've, I've put here my uh, lovely colleague, Dr. Flynn. And so uh, the arrows for the red lines or the maroon lines are the parts of the label that the veterinary care team tends to prioritize. These are the things that we look at first. And the green lines tend to be pet parents. And so again, you can see that very often we're not evaluating a product by looking at the same things. And so again, we're prioritizing manufacturer information, nutritional adequacy statements, and caloric statements. Whereas pet parents tend to look at the ingredients and other terms that are associated with it, things that they're looking for or things that they're looking to avoid. And so we'll go through a few of these items and see, well, how do I sort through this and make a reasonable decision? And so I'm here to say that the most important information for me is the manufacturer contact information. Because a lot of information, really valuable information, is not necessarily on the label. Only sort of the 10,000 foot glossy overview is on the label for me. And so I find that I'm very often looking up nutritional information or contacting companies, and I never judge my client or my patients, but I'm very judgmental about pet foods and the pet food manufacturer. Because I learn a lot when I contact those companies. I learn the nutrition information that I'm after so that I can better serve my patients, but I also learn about their willingness to work with the veterinary team. If I were in business making a product that is supposed to be the sole source of nutrition for your pet, I want a company that makes, your, makes my job or the veterinary care team their job easier, not harder. So, I am looking for things, again, in a complete and balanced product. The, the next, besides the manufacturer information, the contact information is what we call the nutritional adequacy claim. Or you may have heard the AFCO statement, the American Association of Feed Control Officials. There are two ways that a company substantiates to, to the government that their food is nutritious. And so again, the words that you're looking for, and it's always in small print, it's either on the side panel or the back. And it will be a statement that says formulation or animal feeding trials. And we'll go over this a little bit more. And it will also have a statement about the life stage for which this product was formulated. Growth means puppy or kitten. And there now is another subset of growth specifically for large breed puppies, those puppies that are um, dogs that will achieve 70 pounds or greater at adult weight. Maintenance means a, an adult food. So after growing is done, a, a reproduction, gestation, lactation product, or something that says all life stages. And that means that the product is made to meet everything. I'm not a huge fan of an all life stage diet. It will meet the minimum nutritional needs, but in actuality, it will exceed the nutrient needs for many of the life stages. So again, how do I figure out what to do? And so I mostly, the teacher in me, wants to give you resources that hopefully are practical. And so for those of you that ever use a QR code, I've attached those here. You can just put your cell phone camera right up to those QR codes and it will take you right to the link for these resources. If that's not your thing, um, we can make these available after the session today. But I go by the WASAVA, the World Small Animal Associate, Veterinary Association Global Nutrition Committee recommendations. That's a panel of international nutritionist practitioners and veterinarians that came together as a team to, to try to help veterinary healthcare teams on, and owners on how do I figure out what's important to select a pet food company. And really, again, there's 5,000 products out there, but in North America, there are 227 
pet food manufacturers or companies. And so if I spend my effort not learning 5,000 products, but, but looking deeper at the 227 companies within those companies, then that will offer hundreds and hundreds of choices of really, really good products. Another wonderful resource from Wasava is this um, they have a dog and a cat savvy owner's guide to the internet. Again, another way to help you cut through the chase. Um, where can I find reliable, incredible nutrition information? Because there's so much out there that's largely fear inducing. So let me very briefly go over these guidelines that I'm talking about. And again, I hand these out to any of you who visited me know that you almost always walk away with this handout. When I'm evaluating a company, I wanna know who's formulating this food. Do they have a credentialed nutritionist, either a board certified veterinary nutritionist or a PhD nutritionist on staff full time. Again, they're manufacturing a product. They want to be the sole source of nutrition for your pet. And so we want to make sure that somebody who's gone to school, studied health, studied the species, and knows how to oversee or formulate those recipes to make sure it's an awesome product that they have a research and development department and that they're conducting and sponsoring research and publishing that in peer-reviewed journals. So again, they're advancing the field of knowledge. Those companies are good citizen companies because they're helping me learn more and do a better job at the appointment time to, to make your pets stay healthier. I look for companies that undergo very strict quality control standards. Not only they will test their ingredients before they even arrive on their property, they have many, many, many quality control uh, processes and checks throughout the, the line, but especially they're checking the nutritional quality at the end of the product. So you'll hear lots of marketing blarney about how they're cooking all the nutrients out. The really excellent pro uh, companies are testing the finished product. They have nutritionists on board so they know when you cook a product, that we need to add a certain amount of vitamins in at the beginning to get this amount out at the end and that they have accountability. Other criteria are do they own their own manufacturing plant? When you own your own uh, kitchen, basically, you have a lot more control over how it's produced, the manufacturing processes. And so again, it's uh, I look for companies that own their own production plants rather than renting a facility and renting a formulator and they just say, uh, make my recipe. Again, that nutritional adequacy statement, I look for ones that have undergone feeding trials. So they've actually fed this to animals and evaluated their health along the way that they will provide me with any nutrient analysis or digestibility information when I ask it, again, so that I can do a better job for your pets. They publish the calorie information. And now that's a law, so of course that one's there. And this one is not Wasava, but I added it. I want a company that doesn't malign or bash other companies because gosh darn it, the world is just too negative. Now, full disclosure, I am such a nerd that not only do I practice nutrition in my daytime, but my hobbies are also either about kids and critters and feeding them. And so full disclosure, I am serving, I'm honored to serve as the president of the Pet Nutrition Alliance. Now we know that it's really hard for your healthcare team to call or contact companies and ask all those Wasaba questions. So I'm just giving a shout out to the Pet Nutrition Alliance, which operates again a non profit organization on a shoestring budget. This project called Dare to Ask was the project. It's the reason I know there are 227 manufacturers in North America, because we contacted each and every one of them and asked them a subset of those Wasava questions. And so uh, this is mostly aimed at helping the, uh, your healthcare team to evaluate a product that they may not have heard of. So trying to make the world easier for your healthcare team to help you make good decisions for your pets. Another part of my job is really dispelling myths and allaying fears. The good, the great good news is there's a whole host of wonderful pet food products out there, but the marketing information and the fear mongering really makes people uncertain and worried about a lot of things. And so I'm gonna start sort of 
making some highlights for terms that may you may have heard or read about and had some questions. And so just again, as it's a little unusual for dogs and cats eat complete and balanced nutrition, they and we have requirements for nutrients. So again, the nerd in me cares a little less about the ingredients and a lot about the nutrients, the water, the carbohydrates, the fat, protein, vitamins, minerals. I want a product to have all of those essential nutrients to meet the requirements of the dog or the cat for the life stage at which they are. And I can have any number of ingredients to achieve that. So just like a toolbox, there are many different tools to, to accomplish the job. And so the ingredients help me make up the nutrient balance. And so again, when I'm looking at a food, I want to make sure that there's enough protein, there's enough fat, that all the micronutrients, the vitamins and the minerals are in there. And so what I do in the classroom is I ask all of the veterinary students to play what I call the ingredient game. When we're looking at ingredient lists on pet food labels, I want every healthcare team member to be able to answer any one of your questions and look at an ingredient and answer for you, why is that in my pet food? Because there's always a reason. I know that I hear uh, worries of, from pet parents that those chemicals on that on that label are bad for you. I don't want to feed something that I can't pronounce. Weird words like ferrous sulfate, tocopherols, pyridoxine hydrochloride. Oh, those sound awful. But really, again, have no fears. They're not awful things. They're just the proper name for vitamins and minerals. And they're really important and essential to our pet's health. So those are just companies that are, are, that are labeling the full and proper name of vitamins and minerals in, our, in the pet foods to achieve a complete and balanced product. And yet AFCO, again, that organization, they have legal definitions for over 600 ingredient names. And still companies are coming up with new things that are not, that have no legal definition. And so I'll give you one example that sounds like, again, like sort of weird. If I'm looking at a pet food and it says it has apples or plums or tomatoes in there, again, those are not necessarily legally defined. And so if apple is on the ingredient list, it could be the leaf, the stem, the core, or the pulp. And in fact, it probably is. It's probably a byproduct of human nutrition. So after they make your apple juice, they put those leftovers in pet food. But to us looking at an ingredient list, it's very hard to assess quality. And in fact, it's impossible without contacting the company. So if you see a word that sounds lovely, it may or may not be what you're thinking. It's not that whole apple that's in the pet food. And so again, there's lots of marketing terms that really make it really quite confusing. Then trends in feeding, there's a trend toward natural. Again, for us, whole foods is, is how we want to eat. And yet um, there isn't a corollary necessarily in pet food. So things like organic, holistic, wholesome, human grade, natural, premium, all of these different terms, words, 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 what do they really mean? again, to, to uh, parse it down, then I, I've put here the words that have a legal definition that actually have a, a, a definition where I can tell you this is what this means, natural, organic, and human grade. All these other terms that we hear, keto, ancestral, paleo, premium, ultra, holistic, whole food, none of those are legally defined. They're simply a made up marketing term. So it could literally mean anything or it could mean nothing. It's just a fancy word to put on the label. Natural sounds really awesome. However, and it, it doesn't mean it's a bad product. Many great products have the word natural. Legally, natural just means there are no artificial colors or synthetic uh, preservatives. You can have synthetic vitamins or minerals. And in fact, I hope you do. So more foods could be named natural than not. And so again, it doesn't have a lot of valuable meaning for me to differentiate a product. Okay, 
I'm shifting gears a little bit in then picking a food up for a life stage. I sort of alluded to that earlier that AFCO, again, does a very good job of identifying the nutritional requirements for different life stages of our pets. You know that when we have young babies, children, we take them to the pediatrician and we know in the beginning they should either be nursing or have infant formula and not other foods until they reach six months or more. And your pediatrician will tell you when you can start introducing baby food and solid foods and you're supposed to wait for two years until you introduce them to peanuts. It's the very same thing for our little youngsters. And so every stage of life the nutritional requirements will change. And so we want to meet their re requirements and change throughout life. It's very important. And so the very best practice, what's the best food for my pet? It's picking an excellent company that, that meets those Wasava criteria. And then it's looking at that nutritional adequacy statement Hopefully they've done animal feeding trials and then we match it. I have two puppies in my household. So I have two puppies on different puppy foods. And so, you know, I'm old, as you can tell, I've, I've earned my wrinkles. And so I no longer can eat the way I used to eat when I was in my twenties or when I was in vet school. I don't need as many calories, sadly, because I'm not as active and my metabolism has slowed down significantly. So we know that we need to make changes throughout life to make sure that we're meeting their nutritional requirements and then helping them achieve optimal health. So setting the scene when we have puppies and kittens, expect that once they get spayed or neutered, we'll want to make a life, uh, we'll want to make a nutritional change. Once they achieve adulthood, we'll want to make a nutritional change. And so this sort of sets the scene too when we have multi pet households, very often they have multiple needs. And so out of my five dogs at home, two are eating the same thing and the rest have different needs. And as they change in age or get different conditions, I change food appropriately for that. The other thing I wanna point out here is you can see um, geriatrics are some of my most beloved, beloved things. And so it's the area of my PhD research, but what you should note here is that there is no senior life stage. So again, AFCO life stage means the nutrient requirement and senior isn't a life stage from a nutritional standpoint. Certainly seniors need different things, but senior on a pet food is merely a marketing term. So one company's senior food might be nutritionally very, very different. There is no AFCO defined life stage for senior foods. And that's important to know. Most people aren't aware of that. So really as a veterinarian, we want to do an individualized risk assessment. What is their life stage? What is their species? Dogs and cats needs different things. Meeting their needs as they change and altering the recommendation when their needs change too. Cats are again, lovely, lovely species. And sometimes they are so different from my dog friends. And so just to shout out that when kitty, kittens are youngsters, they learn their food preferences from moms. They've done some really great studies that whatever the diet of the queen is, something gets translated even in the milk so that kittens will have a preference for that same type of food that mom ate. But cats also form a very distinct food preference. I liken them to toddlers because they get an idea of what they like and what they don't and it's really heck to change their mind. And so if they grow up in that first four months, ideally, or maybe their window up to a year, what they're exposed to determines their preference. So if I were king, I tell my students, I would like all kittens to be exposed to a mixture, dry kibble and canned food, so that they will form what I call food flexibility throughout life. So later in life, when I need an elder kitty to, to get more moisture or drink more, no way are you gonna get a cat to drink more water. And so I will introduce more canned food because that's the easiest way to get a cat more water. So it's not just about picking the right food. It's 
ever more important or at least as important as feeding that food right. I don't have a lot of time to go into it, but I'm hoping that your vet care team has talked to you about assessing the body condition score. It's a very good fitness check. It's just as important when paired with body weight of what healthy looks like because obesity, unhealthy weight gain and obesity is an epidemic in our pets, both dogs and cats. 50% of dogs and cats in this country are overweight or obese. So very simply, this is like a rib check. There's four spots on the body over the ribs, an aerial view, they should have a waistline. And then over the tail head, there should not be any fat and there should be an abdominal tuck like a six pack in between their hind legs. So again, if you wanted to use that um, QR code, you can get these handouts or I am happy to share them. But basically my very simple trick is to hold your hand flat, palm down, flat fingers. If you imagine that the bones in the back of your hand is the rib cage, and if you're feeling flat over your hand, you should be able without curling your fingers to count your ribs ribs, meaning on your, the bones in your hand very easily. If, it, if you can see them like this, they're too thin. When you can count them individually and easily, they're perfect. And if you have to dig to feel those ribs, they're too thick. They are overweight and overconditioned. And when they have extra body, body fat, we know that that will shorten their lifespan and set them up for many, many, many other health risks. I could talk for days on that topic. So uh, based on some of the questions that were uh, submitted, many of you had questions about uh, less traditional diets. And so um, I'm going to answer some of those questions that were submitted, I hope. And that's looking at myths and controversies and questions because again, I've been so interested in this um, for many years. Uh, lots of clients have an interest in raw meat-based diets. And so what I can tell you is every pet parent that I have ever met our shared goal is that we want the very best for their pet. So uh, with the same goal of having them live long and prosper. And so um, unfortunately, there's a lot of misinformation and, and scary stuff out there. So what I'm hoping to do is look at it from a very balanced approach. When I'm asked about a product or a feeding method, I always want to know about the risks and the benefits and help decide the best product for you, for the pet, for the whole family so that it feels right. There is no one best product for all pets. There are many great choices for almost every pet, every healthy pet for sure. So I've sort of divided this into altern what I call alternative feeding options. Um, and this genre is getting grayer. It used to be quite black and white. There used to be home prepared and commercial. And now there's home prepared cooked, home prepared raw, commercial cooked, commercial raw. And then somewhere in the middle, you'll see things like toppers and mix-ins and appetizers. Please take care if you see something that's a topper or a mix-in and those products are not complete and balanced. And so again, they should not make up any more than five or 10% of the total, but they're, they're often on the shelves right beside a complete and balanced product. And so it's very difficult for our owners to sometimes know the difference. But if you see things like mix-ins, toppers, appetizers, or d'oeuvres, look a little harder because it's probably not a balanced product. And so um, looking at, I've already talked about cooked foods and commercial foods. There are excellent, excellent, excellent choices. Whoops. And so homemade recipes, easily we can help you make homemade recipes. What I know is that when folks find a free recipe, a homemade recipe online or um, or in a book, unless it was formulated by a board certified veterinary nutritionist, when I've analyzed those products, 100% of them have had nutritional deficiencies, excesses, or sometimes both. There are many, uh, quite a number of research papers that have also analyzed homemade recipes and found that they were, um, they were missing something. 
Part of our practice here is to help owners with homemade recipes. And so I'm happy to do that. We can schedule an appointment um, and do that. And I would strongly recommend that you have the help of someone who knows how to do this and help you troubleshoot along the way. Raw meat based diets, again, generally do have the potential to have pathogenic bacteria. And so when I'm talking to people about this, I, my full disclosure, again, my bias is that I have a very, very low tolerance for risk. When my kids were babies, no, the car would not start until they were in their car seat. And now the car doesn't go until everyone's seatbelt is buckled. Knowing full well, the chances of us getting in a wreck on our way to work or home are very, very, very low. But should something happen, I couldn't live with myself. And so I'm going to look, is there any nutritional advantage? And I keep looking at the research each and every year, and there is no nutritional advantage to date. There is no evidence of nutritional advantage from raw food, uh, raw meat-based products. There are dozens and dozens of case reports and, and uh, experimental studies that show that when dogs and cats eat a raw meat-based product, they, they can sometimes become ill, they can sometimes die, and sometimes they look just fine. I can tell you they love raw meat food, but they can also become what we call silent shedders. So they, from one raw meat meal, they can shed salmonella or E. coli for several weeks later. What we know too is the universal dog greeting is to sniff each other's bums. What we know is then what dogs will do is greet us by licking our faces or licking our hands. And I'm supposed to wash my hands after every time I pet my dog, but I can tell you that I don't. And so what we know is that people could be at risk just by a dog eating raw meat or a cat eating raw meat food in the house. If you have an elder or an immunosuppressed person or a baby, please, please, please talk to your veterinary health care team because I don't want any human to be hurt and I don't want any pet to be hurt. So I have worries and concerns. The other things are this other subset of foods that are freeze dried or dehydrated or many of the treats. One of the dog's favorite treats are these things called bully sticks or pizzle sticks. And again, my favorite friends are nerds. And so one of my uh, best friends is a nutritionist at Tufts and she did a bully stick uh, research project. And what we know is that that is just a dehydrated bull penis. And so over a third of those products were contaminated with E. coli, sem or clostridia, clostridia, and even that MRSA, the methyl resistant, so a drug re antibiotic resistant staph infection. They also provide a lot of calories that people don't realize. And so I would ask each and every one of you not to use bully sticks, number one, because it could make your pet sick or they could become shedders and could hurt someone in your household. So I'm very worried. Also, I looked to the FDA for advice, and so they did a two-year study and screened over a thousand pet food samples, and compared to other types of pet food products, the raw foods were more likely to be contaminated with pathogenic bacteria. And so, again, I'm concerned about the public health risks, as well as the pet that's eating that food, and every member of, oh, I have a typo for households. So another report just came out this year of um, linked to one cat food in England that uh, was linked to a tuberculosis outbreak. Again, all linked to one commercial raw um, cat food. So I just think it's a gamble. I think most of the time your pet will do just fine or look just fine on the outside, but potentially underneath there could be risks to them and to you. And so if you're going to use a raw food product, I hope you don't. I hope I've convinced you that it, the risk is just not worth it. But if you do, look for a product that still a company fulfills those Wasava criteria. Why wouldn't I hold them to the same standard of any of the other commercial products? And I would also look for a product that undergoes high pressure pasteurization, HPP. And so again, it's not quite the high temperature of pasteurization, but it uses pressure and some elevation in temperature to pasteurize. Um, and still we call those raw products, but it's a little bit safer. All right, the home stretch. I know it's been a long night. Um, and so I got some questions about 
diet associated dilated cardiomyopathy. I will call that DCM because it's quite a mouthful. Dilated cardiomyopathy is a failure of the heart muscle to contract and it causes eventual heart failure. In 2017, it was discovered an increased incidence of reports of breeds not typical. There is a genetic predisposition in boxer dogs and Irish wolfhounds and Great Danes uh, that tend to be bigger breeds that are known to get cardiomyopathy. But we discovered or we were reporting atypical breeds were getting DCM. And when these clinicians, usually um, most of them were determined by cardiologists, they took a diet history and discovered most of these dogs were eating at the time a grain-free product. So it was dubbed diet-associated DCM. Again, initially thought to be grain-free, it's not just grain-free. It was thought to be a taurine deficiency, which is an amino acid. We now know that only a small subset of dogs that get diet-associated DCM have a taurine deficiency. And when we do, we need to add that back in as a supplement, but most of the time they are not low in taurine. Again, lots of terms then, how do we, how do we describe this phenomenon? Um, for a minute, it was given the term beg, boutique, exotic, or grain-free diets. And now a, it's still under an FDA investigation. It's still ongoing. And there are still things that we don't know, but I'll give you an update about what we do know. We now should think of it in terms of traditional diets or non-traditional diets, and I'll define those more clearly. The diet-associated DCM is from non-traditional diets. Those are diets that are grain-free or use non-traditional ingredients. That would be things that are legumes, so things like chickpea, lentil, any of the beans, or potatoes as a main ingredient. And they are companies that do not fulfill those wasava criteria. And so again, this is an active investigation. It's very, very controversial. And so still there is a main group of people because there's lots of dogs. This is a dog condition, not a cat. There are lots of dogs that are developing, DC, that eat a non-traditional diet and don't develop DCM. The tricky part is there is no early marker for DCM, you must get a echo or an ultrasound of the heart to fully diagnose, is that heart muscle working? And so when they get to that stage, the, they often could get to the point of dying. Diet associated DCM is very different than that genetic kind because if we catch it early, and again, there's no early signs and sudden death is one of those signs, but if we catch it early and we change the diet, there is a reversible component. And so until we figure this out, we still don't know the exact cause. There's probably an interaction between genes and diet together because not all dogs eating non-traditional diets will get DCM. But if you've known anyone who's lost their pet from this preventable disease, it is, excuse the pun, but literally heartbreaking. So until we figure this out, my platform, again, you already know my tolerance for risk is that we cease and desist all non-traditional diets. Because again, the risk to me is not worth it. If it happens to your pet, it's 100%. And it's, it's really tragic. So uh, most of the time when people are searching for a grain-free diet or a non-traditional product, they're trying to achieve some improvement in health. Studies have shown it's most often skin or the perception of allergies. And let me tell you that the great good news is that true food allergies is really quite rare. Allergies are common in our pets, but food allergies are quite rare. And most of the time when I see pets for food allergies, they are misdiagnosed or or they, they truly do not have um, a food allergy. And of the food allergies, that's a small, small, small group, 
even fewer are grain allergies. In the 30 years of practice, I have not diagnosed or confirmed a true grain allergy. So I get lots of questions and I'll finish up really quickly is that, well, can I add taurine to my dog's food and that will reduce the risk of DCM? And the answer is most of the dogs that have DCM, diet associated DCM are not taurine deficiency. I've heard the advice of just adding grain or rice to my dog's food and that will help. And that of course will unbalance that balanced nutrition. Well, what about mixing a non-traditional or a grain-free product with their grain-inclusive product? And again, we don't know the cause, so we don't know how to fix it other than changing at this point to a traditional diet. So again, the summary is it's still really controversial. If you selected a non-traditional food for a health benefit, talk to your team. We can always find a different alternative that will lower the risk um, from DCM. And unlike primary DCM, again, those changes are preventable and reversible. And so um, the research is, is ongoing, so stay tuned. We still have a lot to learn. I wanted to leave a little time for questions, and so I hope that I've done that. It looks like we have about 10 minutes, and I want to thank first and foremost all of you for your attention and letting me talk about my most favorite thing. Also to the team, Scott and Kelsey and Lauren, you have done an amazing job with this series, and I hope you all will attend the next ones coming up because it's we just love talking to, to people that come here and bring your pets and trusting their care to us. Thank you so much, Dr. Churchill, for a great presentation. There's so much information out there about nutrition that it's nice to get the lay of the land from an expert. So if you don't mind, let's jump into some of our attendees' questions. Uh, the first one I have is, are there certain brands or ingredients or ingredient combinations you can recommend unequivocally or even say to avoid? I hope you got the message that I look for companies that have under that fulfill the Wasaba criteria. There are many great companies, and so Hills Pet Nutrition, Nestle Purina, Waltham, Royal Canin, Iams, and on and on. But I will take each company individually. Those for sure I know fulfill those Wasava criteria in spades. Once we pick a manufacturer, then I talk to you about life stage and needs and appetite and find the best fit for your pet. Thank you. Um, what are good long-lasting treats to give to puppies? Bully sticks, dental bones, etc. Are any treats recommended more often than others? Yes because what's life without treats? So don't tell my best kept secret is that all of my colleagues think that the clients that come to visit me that I'm gonna suck the fun right out of your life and forbid all treats. That's, there couldn't be more opposite. But remember about that seesaw or the teeter-totter, what I wanna do is find complete and balanced treats. So when I'm training a puppy, the very best thing would be train them when they're hungry. And so just like when you're coming to the veterinarian, they should not have eaten so that we can offer their regular food so that they're, again, needing high value usually means because we're training them when they already have a full belly. So imagine if I'm trying to feed that toddler with a full meal and then I give them the broccoli, it doesn't taste nearly as good. If you want something to feel special or different, buy a different company or a different food. So if I have a puppy food, I buy a different puppy food and offer that as treats. Um, there are training treats that are complete and balanced, but they're very, very few. And so one little secret for, um, for puppies, they, um, temptations, cat treats are complete and balanced and they're tiny. So again, treats should be about the size of your pinky fingernail. If you think about the portion size, we're big and they're little. Bully sticks, I hope you got the message. Please, please, please don't do it. I don't want anyone to get hurt. Thank you. Um, this has been a popular question. Any advice for geriatric pets, picky eaters, or animals gaining weight? Yeah, so geriatric pets are my most favorite, favorite population, and they're about a third of the pets that we see. What we know is that geriatrics age differently and uniquely. It's the perfect time to come in to see your veterinary team and to get a full health assessment, and then we'll make the right choice for your pet. So again, 
a lot of seniors, their metabolic rate goes down, but their appetite remains robust. So for that pet, I'm going to pick a food that's lower in calories so that they can eat more. I don't want to restrict my poor seniors. If I've made sure that the picky eater that is losing weight, I want to make sure there's no medical problems or any underlying thing. And then I'll feed a food that's really high in calories so they don't have to eat as much and it might be more palatable. So it's finding the right fit. But for all seniors, they need a good health screen so that we can make our very best recommendations to keep them healthy for a long time. Thank you. Um, what is the most common nutrient deficiency you see in dogs and how can one avoid it? Ah, here's the great good news. Deficiencies in this country in our dog and cat population is rare rare, rare. When they're feeding a commercial, when we're feeding a commercial food, again, complete and balanced, that most of the time they're meeting their nutritional needs in spades. The most common nutritional problem or malnutrition is unhealthy weight gain. Again, another hobby of mine is I serve on the board of the Association for Pet Obesity Prevention. So it's really over nutrition. If I'm gonna see a deficiency, it's because treats make up more than that 10%. It's really common in American households for treats to make up about a third of the calories. So imagine if a third of your diet were Haagen-Dazs. So overnutrition is much more of a problem than deficiencies. Thank you. Um... You talked about kind of additives of food. So this question is, can you please share advice on the use of and quantity or frequency of probiotics, vitamin supplements, or fish oils for cats and dogs? Yeah, that's quite a number of things. So I'll try to tease that out a little bit. Supplements or vitamins. Remember, when we're picking a great, excellent food, we don't need to add vitamins. And in fact, most of the pet vitamins, they're literally a a whisper in the wind because those companies know that you're feeding complete and balanced food and they don't want to create toxicities. So it's really a waste of money. Put your money on a great food and you don't need those vitamins. Other supplements, which I do use and prescribe, but when I'm using them, I'm using them in a therapeutic way. So ask your healthcare team. So fish oils, again, are an anti-inflammatory and helpful for arthritis, but they aren't very potent. So for sure, I want to make I want to make sure that your pet is healthy and fit and not overweight because just adding fish oil on top of that won't work. The other big feature is that, um, so I use those in medical ways. There's no indication that those supplements are helpful in a preventive fashion. And the other big takeaway is that in this country, supplements are not regulated. And so there's no assurance per se that the bottle or the potion or the tablet has in it what the label says. So um, if you want to look at supplements, consumerlabs.com, even if you take supplements yourself, consumerlabs.com is a third party tester. And so they evaluate products, send them off to a lab for purity um, and accuracy. And so I use that, it's a subscription service, but I use that all the time to make sure I'm picking a good product. Okay. I know a lot of us share a household with multiple pets. So this question is, how do you manage the weight of one cat when the other cat or cats in the same house do not need the same management? Yeah, therein lies the rub, right? Each pet is an individual. And so from the time of kittenhood, we may even have litter mates that grow at different rates or one gets heavy and one gets thin and they might need different diets. So from the get-go, we're talking about how are we setting up our household to assure that we're feeding them separately so that when or if they need different foods, I have a way to do so. In my household with five dogs and different needs, everybody eats in their crate that makes the crate a lovely place to be. And so they just go in their crate, I close the door so that they eat their own individual foods. They make lovely automatic feeders and those that have a collar or a microchip that will open the door um, that will allow a cat to come. There's all sorts of different tricks, but the bottom line is, is finding a way to allow them to eat their own individual food. Um, there is no one-stop shop for all pets, all times throughout all life. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time for about two more questions. Um, so what are your recommendations on giving dental greenies? 
Uh, so there's dental treats and Green News is this particular brand. I like to fight or debate with my dental friends. And so what we know is that dental disease is very, very common. It's at least as common as unhealthy weight gain. And so we want to make sure we take care of oral care. The very, 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 very best advice is that we should all brush our dog's and cat's teeth once a day, if we can. I give, I'm not able to do it. I wish I were a better owner um, or pet parent. We look for dental treats, but honestly, if you're going to use a dental treat and you want it to actually do the job, you should look on the label and it should have that seal, just like your toothpaste has ADA, American Dental Association, V-O-H-C, the Veterinary Oral Health Care, has a seal that means they actually studied and proved that that product reduced the plaque and tartar. The problem is that most of those dental products, even with the VOHC, you must use them as directed. And when I look at them, they have to make up a third of the caloric intake. So if they're not complete and balanced, I'd really like to throw them all away because you're gonna, at the expense of oral health, you're impairing their nutrient balance. But you mentioned Greenies, and Greenies to date is the one product I know that is complete and balanced. And so you'll want to reduce the food and equivalent amount of calories. Dental treats carry a lot of calories, so you need to adjust it. But Greenies are complete and balanced, and so they're a really lovely complement if you're not able to brush teeth. That is good to hear. Thank you. So I think we have time for just one last question, and it's an important one. Um, they're all important, Scott. <laughs> they're all important. Um, how should I measure 5% of my dog's treats? Should I use a scale or base it on calories? Yes, it should be calories. Thank you for asking that. It is a very important one. So let me just use a cat as an example. A typical cat will need uh, 200 calories. And so ideally, I would like them to not, if, unless I'm using a different food that's complete and balanced, then it doesn't matter. I just need to meet that 200 calories. But the treats, if they're extra treats, it should be no more than 10 or max 20 calories. It should be the percentage of calories. Now remember, every pet food must have calories per cup or calories per can on the label. So if you know how much your dog or cat is eating per day, you can figure out that percentage. But really ask your healthcare team. We'd love to help you with those questions and make a treat plan just like we want to make a feeding plan. Perfect. Thank you so much to Dr. Churchill for your presentation and insights. And thank you to our many participants that shared such thoughtful questions during the presentation. As always, the Veterinary Medical Center is here for you 24 seven to help care for your pet. Please don't hesitate to reach out. Next month, the VMC Animal Health Education Series will welcome Dr. Alistair McVeigh and Dr. Susan Arnold, whose presentation on spinal cord issues in dogs and cats will be discussed. To help support our work with animals, please consider making a gift to support the VMC on Minnesota's Day of Giving, Give to the Max Day, this Thursday. All gifts will be matched dollar to dollar up to $20,000 and support of all sizes makes a difference in the lives of animals. Thank you again for attending tonight and we hope you and your families are well during this time. Have a good night. Thank you.